Um, so since it's being recorded, if you guys do have a discussion, that was kind of the reason we're recording it. Um, make sure you speak up as loud as you can because the mic is just coming out of the computer. So trying to improvise. And that'll also be available for anybody who wasn't here tonight since we're kind of sparse with Owens and Fair. Um, so obviously we're covering the Maui River boat collision that everybody got in their email. Should have seen the copy. Does anybody want a copy to look over while we're doing this? All right. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> you were the only one actually shaking your head. Oh. But it was just funny. Um, so the objectives of what we're going to go over tonight, pretty simple. We're going to understand how the incident played out. Was, everybody, was there anybody here that wasn't on this run? Okay. So for those of you especially who weren't here to be part of it, to kind of catch you up and, and uh, get you as close to being there as you can by listening to the, the audio, um, we'll recognize the factors that contributed to the fact that the outcome was really good. <laughs> I mean, overall, everything went really well, considering some of the challenges we faced. Um, and an unusual situation all around. And then, hopefully when you leave here, you'll be able to understand and be able to explain to other people the recommendations, talk about them, um, <laughs> kind of weigh in on your own uh, with the people who aren't here tonight, wherever they are, um, you know, and, and everybody can kind of, basically what we've done after, after each of these is, you know, kind of come up with, is there a better way to do things? Is there something we could change? Or uh, just, the ideas that come out of these have been uh, really beneficial, we think, as a training committee to be able to um, present this to you guys and then get the feedback that we've gotten to make, make changes, and it's, it's worked out really well. So the outline of tonight, we're going to go over the incident, uh, talk about the agencies involved and the actual units responding, listen to the radio traffic, talk about the factors contributing to the success, and then we'll go over the 10 recommendations for improvement that you saw in the report if you got a chance to glance through that. Uh, so, just the gist of the incident, the call came in at 1923, uh, which for us, obviously, it was a Monday, July 11th, so drill night, we were here, we were working on water rescue, which was just completely coincidental, we were already at the marina, um, and basically the crews that were not on the boat almost witnessed this thing happen. Everybody said it kind of sounded like fireworks, or something like that, turned around, started realizing there was something going on. Um, Kind of an unusual situation for us to be right there when a water rescue incident completely begins, you know, being there at the very instant it happens. Um, so this is a list of the agencies that were ultimately involved. Obviously us and the DOC, our medical director, um, Perrysburg Township, Perrysburg City, Toledo, Lucas County EMS, ProMedica, and their medical director was responding separately, and then the Coast Guard. And this doesn't include any of the law enforcement, which was also so these are the resources, all in all, that were assigned to this run. So initially, we had every, every unit on scene that we had staffed that night. Uh, so the only thing we didn't have staffed was Medic 30. Um, Chief 29 was coming from Council. Mm -hmm. And the other units requested uh, City's boat, Township's boat, Chief 70, actually it should be Chief 75, uh, Utility 74, the Coast Guard, Medic 38 was requested later in the incident. Uh, our medical director, and then the list of the things that were canceled include uh, Toledo's water rescue assignment, which that alone is engine five, truck five, the water rescue unit towing the Zodiac, and they were also sending us the fire boat and the dive boat, um, from what I understand. Life Squad One is kind of part of that, but not entirely. It's still separate in Lucas County. Um, so we were getting Life Squad One and Life Squad Four. Life Squad One starts usually the dive team's Life Squad, right? Yeah, and how it works. be kind of responsible for the dive. And then Mobile Doc 1, which is Dr. Lindstrom uh, with ProMedica, and that ProMedica error was coming because we had a report of an unconscious person. So the next part is the, the radio traffic. I'm just going to let it all play out. Um, it's not edited uh, time-wise, except where the slide actually changes. There's a little gap that I took out there. But as we go, it'll show you um, each benchmark as we go through it. So we'll kind of sit back and listen to that. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Colin. N29, both where are you guys at? Can you repeat? What is your location? Table Street. Start heading back towards the marina. 
those uh, incidents on the water, we're not sure exactly what happened, but it looks like two boats may have hit. There's people in the water right now. Our boats went out, okay. I didn't explain, but I should have the, uh, the numbers on the left-hand side are just the minutes from the... Roger, 203, Wood County. Go ahead. Are uh, you clear on engine 29 and boat 29's traffic? Yeah, I just heard the end of it that people were in the water. Can you repeat? Uh, appears that we have uh, two boats colliding in the river a mile, about a half mile west of the marina. Go ahead and generate me a run. Do you need anyone toned out for it or are they all clear? Uh, no need to zone out uh, Rossford units. Go ahead and start the uh, Perrysburg Township and Perrysburg City with their boats. And we're going to go ahead and move this incident to 15-2. Uh, 15-2. There's two or three. How about those cars? Okay. Two three, we counting. Three, go ahead. Two three is going to be Marina Command. Go ahead and start me the Coast Guard as well. Clear on Coast Guard. Coast Guard, I just said, we're currently being in contact with Coast Guard. Station 74, Rossford requesting a boat. Enter into Rossford Marina. Perrysburg Township Station 74, Rossford requesting a boat for a boat accident. Enter in at the Rossford Marina, WPDJ 609. Station 74, clear on the call. Station 74, clear on the call. Oh, yeah. County Marina Command. Marina Command, go ahead. I've got Toledo fire on the line. They overheard the traffic. They would like to know if you need them to respond as well. Yeah, we'll go ahead and take them. We'll see who uh, is the closest to get to us. Let them know thank you for their uh, help. That's clear, we'll let them know. Fireboat 29, what county? Fireboat 29. Make sure you let Toledo know too that we're operating on a 15-2. Fireboat 29, can you repeat your traffic? Can you make sure you let Toledo Fire know we're operating on 52? Also, Toledo Coast Guard has been notified. We'll be in route. You're clear. Also got an additional report that there is at least one unconscious male, guys. Good, clear. Engine 29 command. You want to move on that side? Code 29 is short command. We're going to come by and uh, try to pick up a backboard from you. Come here, no cable 29. Medic 29 stationed at the entrance of the marina. Uh, we have no medical equipment with us as well. Command, okay. Can you retrieve from the medic unit? Now, uh, please, please. Thank you. Two point nine with Kelly. What location at the marina? 
Right. Utility 74 and the boat will be en route. Did they have an off channel? I'll give them a call back and find out. 275 Grays for Township. I'll be en route heading the marina. They're on 15-2. Okay, 15 Engine 29 is going to set up LZ for you. He's going to have got the message, and I'll be heading up there as well. Engine 29 is going to set up LZ for you. Engine 29 is going to set up LZ for you. There is but station 38, Chief 29. Station 38, go ahead. We have units uh, responding to the docks to get the boat. What else do you need? Okay, for now, uh, I suspect that's good. Uh, I'll keep you advised here in just a minute of what, uh, what else I might need. Okay. We're at County Marina, uh, Command. Correct, and the LZ is going to be at the entrance of the marina, engine 29, and what tech channel do you want them on? And we'll follow the procedure through Lucas County Mess with engine 29. We're going to land them at the marina ball field. Uh, just get us an ET and let us know who it is and get them in there. Both 29 on scene, we have one overturned boat, one other person in the water. We'll get to the trailer here in a second. We're working on making our way up the building. All right, Chief 29 to Boat 29. Give me a victim count when you can, okay? Yeah, we'll see how we got there, Okay. Chief 29, Station 38. Go ahead. Can you me one more medic unit at our location, Code 2, for now? Okay. Code 29 to command, we have no one unconscious. We've got one patient with a laceration ahead. We're going to close it up to get you a better jump ahead. Chief 29 has got the message, thanks. Code County Marina Command. Marina Command is passing command from 203 to Chief 29. Put the face to face. Code County, go ahead and trip. Command, I've got the Coast Guard on the line. They're requesting to know if you have any idea how many people uh, are injured or in the water. If there's any other information you can relay to them. Their ETA is about 20 minutes. Yeah, Chief 29 has got the message. Uh, we know we got at least one patient. We haven't got a victim count yet. Coast 29 to Command, we have direct contact with the Coast Guard on the line. Coast Guard, Command, Coast Guard, Command, Coast Guard, Command, Okay. What county are you clear on that? We're kind of clear to rack down with the person we have on the phone. Thanks. We're counting two twenty nine. Two twenty nine, go ahead. Pro Medica is going to call me back in the ETA class. Chief 29 has got the message. Boat 29 command, you can probably cancel Coast Guard. He's awake, Lord and Orient, and conscious. Okay, sir, again, can somebody get us a victim count? And you're canceling your ambulance because it was told you have direct contact with the Coast Guard on the radio. Chief 
we got two green patients, one yellow patient. Go ahead and cancel the ambulance here. Okay, that's cancel your ambulance. You have two total patients, one green, one yellow. Two green, one yellow. Two green, one yellow for a total of three. You try not to get the message. Marina Command, Wood County, you can't cancel them for Medicare. Uh, Wood County is clear, right? Chief, you want your command to vote 29? Do you think you need flying dock here? One word. Okay. MD-51, are you okay to continue to the scene code three? One point, one point, ten minutes out. Okay. End point nine, Mr. Mann. We're just clarifying we're still setting up the LZ. That's negative, I can tell you. Cancel the angle. Uh, that's clear. No, what do you need? Close point, I command. We have patient contact. We've got one patient on our boat. We can have the overturn boat. We're going to get the other two patients on here if we can. Lucas County, Chief 29, 15-2. Okay, boat 29, I have your message. Lucas County, that's good. Chief, be advised, we got Life Squad 1 4 and MD 1 responding out that location, also, as well as Water Rescue. Are you going to need any of that out there? Chief Water Rescue coming. You can cancel the Life Squad assignments. We've got Unit 51 and we got uh, two medic units here. Uh, EMS Happy, thank you. Yeah, can you find out if all. Utility 74, Perry for Count 50, Utility 74 in the motor area. Okay, Utility 74, now need any more uh, nautical resources your way. Provide to need the Coast Guard to continue to secure the boat. We also have the uh, jet ski. Okay. So the boat versus jet ski. Okay, uh, we got that. The Coast Guard just passed the marina, and we'll hold off on launching any more resources. Sounds good. Utility 74, Perrysburg Township. Utility 74, go ahead. Utility 74 and both 74 states at the marina. Utility 74 and both 74 states at the Rossford Marina. Boat 29. 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 Boat Yeah, they got the Chief, do you want us to just go to our dock? Or do you want us in a different location? Just come right to the marina. We're waiting for you. Both way in, okay. Just come right up to the launch as close as you can get. Got it. 329, MD-51. MD-51. I bet that 300 uh, maroon, is there somewhere else we need to go? 300 Hanum. So when you come through town to pass the fire station, you're going to come to the stoplight by the library, there to the right, first street on the right, come all the way down. 
Perrysburg knew they could staff something else and send it our way if they needed to. Toledo was monitoring. I'm not, from what I understand, talking to Yoder, it wasn't even Lucas County EMS that told them. Somehow Toledo heard it, or they got the call first. That was it. They got the call first, transferred it, and so they knew we were going to have a water rescue going on and offered their assistance. So we had two departments that, you know, <laughs> there's, there's been this general feeling in the last however long that offering assistance like that is freelancing on some weird level that that's something that's bad. But it's really not. It's just proactive. <laughs> if you hear somebody else has something going on and you feel like you can help, if you ask and they say no, okay. If you ask and they say yes, all the better for them to either have more people on scene or to help the people on scene. Um, you know, we had, we had so much of that in this call, which like Chief said, probably stemmed mostly from the double structure fire day of just finally realizing we really need to, we really need to look out for each other because we're all, you know, we're all in that position where we could all use more hands on incidents like these. Yeah, like just swapping door codes. We would have never yeah. done that six months ago. Pish posh. <laughs> um, again, overall, we all operated well in 15-2. That wasn't an issue we had where usually that, that comes up somehow, some way. Oh crap, somebody was on the wrong channel or oh crap, what channel does a water rescue go on? Now on some level it probably helped that the cap assigned the channel. But if you, um, you know, if, if you're in that situation where um, your command, even if we, if, if it's not an on-view incident like this one was, you know, you can make it clear uh, to dispatch over the course of the incident, you know, you don't need to remind them every time, but let them know, hey, when you notify these other departments, let them know we're on 15-2. And that worked out very well this time. Um, one of the things that didn't work that we'll talk about later is, is the bridge between Toledo and uh, and R152, and we'll talk about that. But the thing that helped us and what kind of still made that work was Lucas County was the bridge between our two counties. They, and it helped to some extent, I'm sure, that Yoder and Will, uh, Will from Northwood, were up there. And yes? Keep going, but I oh, okay. when you get Oh, yeah. Um, on some level, that helped, but overall, they're on the ball in Lucas County EMS. They're sitting between, they're, they're sitting next to Toledo Fire. They have access to our channels probably more so than, than Toledo could have switched over. Um, and they, they're used to talking to outlying departments more than Toledo is. So in this case, they served as the bridge and it worked. It delayed us a little in getting a little bit of information, but overall, that worked. Yeah, Chief. All right, so talk about this a little bit. Uh, when I worked there, this was technically a big no-no. And the, the previous communications manager was worried that if they did this once, that crews would expect that all the time. Uh, and of course, I, I get it, and of course they're really not a Wood County agency, et cetera. Uh, so I made sure the very next day that I called down there and talked to Ralph, because I sure didn't want these guys getting in trouble, like they were interfering or not really doing their job or uh, whatever else. So I, when I talked to Ralph, he seemed to be of the ilk that if this were to happen again, that I, I made sure to be very clear that they are invited on to talk in our talk groups. And if they have information like visas on bypass, that's kind of really when we need it. We don't need that five minutes from now when we're on I-75 getting ready to exit a downtown and now, oh, shit, we got a call report and now they're on bypass. So I'm hoping that we kind of, again, took down a little barrier here, but again, not long ago, you could have potentially gotten yourself written up for this because, uh, you know, you're, you're, it's not really a Lucas County incident, sort of. Uh, it was very, very hot potato item. Another thing that will factor into that, and correct me if I say anything because I'm just shooting off what you're saying, but the MCI protocol with the fact that we're playing together through, and that'll go through. Well, the first kick in armor was around the Lucas County Hunter system, which oh, right. was kind of how we wedged into that a little bit. When I worked there was, you know, well, we're not really, you know, Wood County, but we're on the Lucas County system. We can't really not help if we're going to listen to that or whatever. So, anyway, continue on. But Are you talking about when they called and said that St. Beavis was on bypass? And then they told us to go fire with dispatching crews and who were scared. They gave us the running order who was coming. Because um, yeah. Toledo yeah. didn't come to our channel to tell us any of that. They knew that that had not happened. They knew that Toledo was on their own channel, and they wanted to give us a heads up. Hey, you got a slew of stuff coming that you may not even know is already on the way. You know, the life squads, we, we requested the water rescue assignment, but not necessarily the two life squads. Um, and we didn't know the dock, which would be going through Lucas County. 
Um, but there is a workaround for this in terms of not waiting for them, and that is you can assign get somebody to talk. Yeah, assign somebody to talk to Lucas County like we would do that EMS group officer or EMS group supervisor like we would in an MCI, where that is the person who communicates with the hospital. Say this was a boat full of. You know, 10, people. 10 people, exactly. Now we've got an MCI. Now we've got to figure out what hospitals we can go to, how many rigs we can get from wherever with the MCI protocol, things like that. So we still have, there is a door still there, but we kind of took a window on this one that might turn into a door a little bit more because um, things are kind of, the common sense is coming through, basically. But think of that as an option if it's something where you need to communicate with Lucas County or for some reason you've requested Toledo and you can't hear them and you're not sure how to get to their channel or what channel you're supposed to be on to talk to them, Lucas County, we're used to doing it. Go and ask them, and they can at least point you in the right direction. Any firm, Jeff? Um, and just overall, obviously, the training, preparation, and professionalism. I mean, that always comes back to um, how well things play out. It, it, it always does. And everybody on scene knew what their job was, knew what to do. Um, and without that, we wouldn't have any of the rest of this. So with that, we'll take a quick break, um, get more food, do whatever you need to do, and uh, we'll come back in five minutes. All right. So now we'll get into the actual recommendations um, that the training committee came up with, working with the chiefs. Um, things to kind of just keep in mind and think about, uh, not only in water rescue incidents, some of it is specific, but a lot of it is stuff that we can carry over to any kind of incident. Same thing we talked about with nights in. Some of it's really specific, some of it's gonna be, um, you know, any sort of high risk, low frequency event. Uh, the goal being taking out those dominoes that could potentially start a chain reaction to a negative ending versus a successful ending. So uh, the uh, normalization of deviance, basically. The, the fact that we could do everything wrong and still have a good outcome, potentially, and we say, okay, we have a good outcome. Well, we wanna look at the things that we had a good outcome but not everything went perfect because our job doesn't go perfectly. So it seems nitpicky, but really it's just recognizing and potentially making little tweaks here and there to make us that much better the next time. Just so everybody understands what the, the mindset is. And I think after having done these a couple times now, I think people kind of are getting that um, and understanding it's not meant to nitpick anybody in particular. Uh, so the first one uh, is gonna be ensure proper incident command. And usually, um, you look at any NIOSH report for a firefighter line of duty death, this is usually the first one anyway. Um, incident command is one of those things that uh, comes up over and over and over again, so we'll, we'll hit on that. Um, understanding options when it comes to multiple talk groups with the scale of the incident. Uh, it sounds like a lot, I'll kind of break it down and make it make sense. Um, understand ICS considerations depending on how big the incident gets, uh, you know, looking at um, how you're organizing your incident. Uh, consideration for automatic aid for water rescues, which we don't have right now, whether we want to or whether we don't want to look into it, um, we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll understand what the interoperability issue was with Toledo Fire and talk about what we're doing to figure that out in terms of uh, future mutual aid requests. Uh, understand and solve, hopefully, the interoperability issues with the Coast Guard uh, and the communication with that. Um, and then we'll get into kind of the specifics of just the little things that kind of came up and some have already been, uh, been basically resolved. Um, considering Boat 29 riding assignments and then headsets for the boat uh, with all that money that we have, of course. Um, not well, not with the popcorn machine, right. But um, <clears throat> using only one term for a single resource, so uh, making sure we're, we're always calling something the same thing. Uh, including a BLS kit on Boat 29 in case of things like this, and then uh, clearly notifying Wood County where we're gonna be uh, on a drill night. And again, something that seems very minor, but that was one of the things that came up uh, during our discussion, so. Uh, so for, to start with this, if you guys look through the PIR at all, there's a, there's a form that we took from uh, uh, the Gasaway Consulting Group, which does the Situational Awareness Matters website and all that stuff. Uh, he's a doctor, he studies this stuff, and he came up with this checklist that has 25 things on it that basically assesses whether you had solid incident command. And again, the reason he developed this is because that is something that is, is the first thing to get pointed at when something goes bad on the fire ground is the incident commander didn't do this or didn't do that. So this way, every incident you have, <coughs> and 
we have this as a resource that, that we can look at any time. If you're commanded an incident and you want to go back and check and see, okay, how did I do on this? It's, a, it's basically a grade card for yourself. And again, we're not always going to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect as long as you're using it to better yourself and, and kind of understand what the goal is behind it. Um, so I won't read all 25 to you, but I don't want to focus on just the bad either. <laughs> so I want to talk about just in terms of breaking it up, that was, those were the things that we said yes. As, as the group, when we talked about it, those were the things that, yes, our incident command structure included those things. That was a passing grade for those. So for the majority, we were good. What's in red is what we're going to talk about, and I'll give you those questions as we go over that topic. Does that kind of make sense? So not nitpicking the bad things, but just, you know, we, we, we did the green things good, and we do those consistently well. Um, so we're going to stick with just what we can learn from this incident. So the question, the first question that, that was a no answer was, there was one clearly defined incident commander at all times during the incident. You guys listen to the radio traffic. You, you know that as the committee we, we figured out we did not do this. What did you guys hear that trips your trigger with, with this question? Captain Vasek to chime in. We had Marina Command and Chief 29 both running command for five minutes. Chief 29 was referring to himself as Chief 29. Marina Command was referring to himself as Marina Command. But both were assuming the role of incident command. For five minutes, we had two incident commanders. That is a long time to have two people in charge of the scene. <clears throat> When we did do, when you did hear Captain Vasek do the face-to-face -face and pass command, transfer command, I'm sorry, um, Chief 29 continued to call himself Chief 29, so instead of assuming the role of Marina Command, so where dispatch is calling Marina Command, and now Chief 29's answering, there's still some ambiguity there of, okay, who's actually in charge of the scene? And that comes into play with the mutual aid calling in and requesting information, um, calling in to offer more resources, uh, and basically just continuity. I mean, you, you want to, if it starts out Marina Command with Captain Vasek and you transfer command, it should stay Marina Command the entire way through. Uh, and a lot of that is because on some scenes, the chief will not be command. He may pass it, he may be the Charlie side, especially if, you know, if, if let's say Chief Rodriguez beats us to a fire down the street from his house and he takes command and Josh gets there and decides, I'm gonna let him stay command, I'm gonna go to the Charlie side. Uh, as long as that's okay with him. So now we've got Chief 29, which would you would assume would be the chief running the fire in Rossford, but Chief 75 was already there minutes earlier, already in command, and our chief says, no, that's fine. But now who are they going to call? <laughs> that goes with me. So you want to make sure you use those terminologies um, clearly when you're, you're taking command. And the overlap of command, um, when if you... If you do arrive on scene as a senior member of the department and you have a uh, less senior member running command and you want to transfer, you know, go to them, do the face-to-face. -face. What have you got? What have you already got coming? What's the situation? What else do you need? Okay, let's transfer command. Do that on the radio so everybody knows that the voice is going to change, and then you're good. And that ultimately happened. <clears throat> it just took us five minutes to get those two people together. And you guys were geographically separated too, correct? Right. So you weren't even next to each other. He didn't land where I told him to land. <laughs> so you guys weren't next to each other and both asking for different resources and different, different questions um, and not completely sure one hand's doing one thing, one hand's doing another. That, do you, if you apply that, take it away from this incident because it went well, but if you apply that to, say, a house fire, um, and you have one person who thinks the other person is doing this, and this person thinks this person is doing that, and both are supposed to be keeping track of crews and keeping track of what else is coming and how many resources are coming. Do you see where that could get horribly confusing and, and detrimental to the incident? Does it make sense? So that's why you know we hit on this a lot. Um, command was passed only when necessary and only after a briefing. So again, the briefing was conducted. The transfer was at 12 minutes into the incident. Um, that that portion of it went well. It was just that it wasn't um, it wasn't technically passed after a briefing because there was that 
that five minute gap. Um, there were no conflicting orders or conflicting tactics. I think at one point you heard Wood County stutter trying to figure out who to talk to. Um, and so you had a little bit of that uh, confusion of, okay, which, which person's requesting what? Um, Captain Vasek was already talking to us on the radio, getting information from the boat. And then Chief got on scene and started requesting information from the boat. That was information they could have shared either face-to-face -face, um, or if they had to stay ge geographically separated for some reason, shared over the radio, hey, Chief, here's what I got. The boat's doing this. We've got these resources coming. Do you want command? Yep, cool. Transferring command to Chief 29. Any questions about that one before we move on to number two? Because this one gets a little confusing, potentially. OK. So understanding our multiple talk group options in a larger scale incident. Now, talking to the chief, this wasn't something that necessarily needed to happen on this incident. But had we continued with the scale that we, we had in terms of the number of resources coming, it was definitely a possibility if, if things continued to grow. Um, so radio traffic was disciplined and manageable. That's one of the questions that we answered no to. Disciplined and manageable. There was a lot of radio traffic. And you heard kind of a mix of radio uh, talk groups on there, but it was still a lot of radio traffic. Um, some of it, MD51. not entirely necessary. MD51. I bet that 300 uh, maroon, is there somewhere else we need to go? 300 Hanum. So when you come through town to pass the fire station, you're going to come to the stoplight by the library, veer to the right, first street on the right, come all the way down. So in that time, if anybody needed to get urgent information out, we're giving turn-by-turn -turn directions to a resource on the way to the scene. Um, <laughs> does, that, does that seem like, and I'm not asking rhetorically, um, because there are some options here, but does that seem like a good use of resources on the radio, a good use of airtime? We need the doc there. We requested him, right? If he doesn't get there, what's the point? <laughs> he needs to get there. He can't look on his phone. He potentially could pull over, but it's an emergency response. And apparently, whatever he was using before wasn't able to get him to where he needed to be. So is it is it vital information if we're trying to get the doc there? Yeah, it is. But is there another way we could have gone about it? Absolutely. Um, one way that that is potentially uh, an option in the back of your head, if we have somebody coming from somewhere else, have the police meet them at the city border if, if it's going to be a confusing location. The problem with us is we're lucky to have two cops on, and they're probably both going to be at whatever we're at if it's that big. Um, so the other concept that we'll go into in a second uh, will allow for us to talk to people, to give them directions if we need to, to uh, separate some of that non-urgent traffic from the operations traffic, to make sure that every communication from the hot zone crews was heard the first time it was transmitted. I was bonked while he was giving directions, while we were coming in on the boat, waiting and waiting and waiting to try and get traffic through. So we need to make sure that the operations have direct contact with somebody that can hear them and talk to them. So if all our requested units had still continued, again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 22 different resources, single unit resources, responding to our scene. All of them coming to our channel saying, we're in route, where are we going, where's this marina at? We can break that into two, two different sections. So had the incident grown larger, we could have left 15 to his operations. Um, this may sound familiar because it was the way a lot of Mayday procedures were up until they figured out this was a bad idea for Maydays. Because, in, and to just explain this real quick, Maydays, they were separating it so that way if, if <laughs> I'll use me as the example, if I have the Mayday, Stotts can just talk directly to me and there's no other radio traffic. The problem is, if you change radio channels and you're right next to me and you don't know that I'm the one you're looking for, they're not even going to know, hey, we can just pull Barrett out and he's going to walk up the stairs and he's fine. So that's where in May days it doesn't make sense. It makes sense for everybody to stay on the same channel and just keep radio traffic to a minimum. With a larger scale incident where you're going to be bringing in more people, you can use operations and leave it there and then also start a command channel. So operations 
would require one person, and in this case it probably would have been Andrew, to assume the role of operations sections chief. So this person is just going to talk to the crews that are on scene. Um, and then he'll also talk to command and relay information and relay needs. Um, and they may sit right next to each other while they're running this scene, or they may be on either side of the marina. So then, if you notify Wood County, we're going to use 15-3 as a command channel. We need all units responding to start on 15-3, and then as we get a tally of them, we'll tell them to move to 15-2. So command will talk to dispatch there, so that way dispatch isn't even on this channel. They're still monitoring because that's still part of their responsibility. But now we're not calling Wood County, hey, what's the ETA on the Coast Guard? Hey, here's who we need ProMedica to talk to us. Uh, here's where they're gonna land. Here's what channel they're gonna be on. All that can be done on the command channel while all the operations are going on to actually conduct the rescue and get to the shore. Command will also talk to, like I said, the resources en route. And then command can talk to staging. Um, staging would have been <laughs> potentially necessary with as many crews as we had coming. Um, we do have a pretty good staging location down there already with as much room as there is, but say we have a second alarm, um, staging is an automatic thing for a second alarm. You gotta give a staging location per our procedure. Um, so command's gonna have to talk to somebody and they'll talk to staging. What have you got there? Let me know what crews are, are on scene in staging. And then as operations needs those crews, operations a command, do you have another engine to send me? They'll send another engine from staging. So does that breakdown make sense? Or is this confusing as, as everything? <laughs> is it confusing anybody, genuinely? It's, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to explain um, because we don't do it very often. <laughs> we don't have large scale incidents like this very often. And this easily could have been a large scale incident. That, that would have had a lot of people on the same channel. And I know we normally don't talk about staying or splitting up channels. Um, so if you have a question about it, or if you don't like it, or if you have a concern about it, or if you think it's gonna be confusing, um, you know, share it. Is the staging supervisor gonna be on the command channel? Yes. Once a writ is staged, do they then switch to the operations channel, or do they stay on the stage? They stay on the... They stay on the command channel uh -huh. to get the word from staging to go up. Okay. So until you are actually part of the incident, until you actually move into the operations from staging, you will still be on the command channel. Okay. Um, now chances are, not to make it confusing, but you'll probably have somebody else with a radio on monitoring the operations channel, but that officer's radio should be on, in this instance, 15-3 to say, um, you know, engine 29 is staged, we're ALS with four. Okay. And then that staging officer will jot that down. When operation says, operations to commands, I need another engine. Command okay. Command to staging, and this is on two separate radios. Mm -hmm. Command to staging, I need you to send another engine. This is where you need them to go. Okay. Engine 29 is okay, switch into 15-2. Switch over. Make sense? Makes sense. Sweet, for everybody else too? Slight head nods. Um, again, it's not a frequent thing. Uh, we're talking, you know, like I said, if this, had, if this had continued to escalate, if it was more people potentially, Lake Township's an example of this. Um, and the goal of this is to keep the urgent traffic, basically, the important traffic of the operations on one channel so other people are not walking on them with, with unnecessary quote-unquote traffic. Um, and, and basically for our safety as the operations crews. So we'll go on to number three if there's no more questions. Um, this is the ICS breakdown of, of our scene. Uh, looking at, at ICS as much as I mention it when, when I'm talking to you guys, do you guys see anything that, that is interesting to you about this? Besides the fact that we have Chief 29 and Marina Command both ghost IC Ignis. Span of control. Right now our span of control was 1 to 11, or 2 to 11, depending on how you look at it. But <laughs> for what it really should be, it was 1 to 11. What's our, what's our ideal span of control? 7. 7? Yeah, usually 5 to 7. Is 1 to 11 unacceptable? 
Not necessarily. There's there's an ideal area, but that doesn't mean that you if you can control it and it's going fine, that's fine. But again, had this incident continued to escalate, had we had all those canceled crews continue on and end up with 20 some crews, now we've got to start thinking how do we break this apart? Um, and one of the other things we were lacking was we didn't have an incident safety officer. That was one of the big questions that's, that's asked in the sheet. So taking into consideration span of control, the potential for the, the scene to escalate to a, to a larger number of resources, and uh, the incident safety officer built into that. Um, this is more what we were looking at in terms of setting up for the next step, being one step ahead. Even though those crews got canceled, if we had broken it down, Marina Command, to the safety officer, then down to the operations group, or uh, operations section chief, marine group, EMS group, landing zone division, and staging in here was in operations just because this wasn't the, the two channel thing. If we didn't do the two channel thing, staging could be there. Um, so marine group, if, if you wanted to do that, and again, this is all whatever works for you. Um, would keep the boats together so the boats can communicate with one person. Um, one of the things we had an issue with at a water rescue in Waterville was we had somebody hanging onto a tree and they didn't know what boat kept going past them because all the boats in western Lucas County are exactly the same. They're the same manufacturer, the name of the fire department's on the side but it's almost underwater when you've got flowing water like that, and the lights are all the same colors. So <laughs> if, if operation says operations to all the boats on scene, uh, turn your lights off one at a time or something like that. That gets a little too involved for operations. Operations Marine Group, I need you to talk to your boats and tell them, you know, stagger having their lights on and we need to figure out which one the caller says he sees with his lights off at whatever time. So it just gives a little more breakdown to, to the boats coming to the scene. And again, this would have been more setting us up for that next step if we had the dive boat the water rescue boat. Um, Coast Guard doesn't really fall under us in terms of our operations. They kind of just do their own thing. But we did have three more boats coming our way. Uh, EMS group, we've talked about that a hundred times. Uh, that would be the person, again, that would be talking to Lucas County on the radio. Hey, here's what we've got. Here's what we potentially need. Or we don't need those life squads you're sending us. Or whatever the case is. Um, so under that would be your medic units. Uh, landing zone division, which we did have, Engine 29 handled that. Excuse me. Um, and then, like I said, staging, if we switch the, the channel setup, staging could actually end up being uh, in a different spot. It would actually be under, um, it's just one of those crazy ICS things. It would be separate and it would report to command instead of to uh, operation. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that before we get into auto? All right. We don't have automatic aid for water rescues right now. So right off the bat, we had a great opportunity for CAP to jump on and say, get us Perrysburg City, get us Perrysburg Township. Um, but if that happened at 3 in the morning, and it takes us 10 minutes to get here, and we're still, you know, Wood County's not going to call Perrysburg City and Perrysburg Township on their own. They, they can't. That's not part of our procedure. So we're sending one boat to a potential boat collision, and unless Toledo calls and says, hey, do you want us? Well, Toledo could call, and dispatch could say, well, they haven't even answered the call yet. We've got to talk to them. So looking at the, consider the, the, the idea of automatic mutual aid for water rescues. Um, and part of it comes from this. Uh, additional help was called using a pre-established system. So the pre-established system in this instance, or in this example from this, this check sheet is a second alarm, which we do have. We have the second alarm, the third alarm, that we can call dispatch and we know what we're getting. Um, so if we don't want to go the automatic route, or uh, we, we want at least another option, um, if, we, if we don't want to go the automatic aid route, we could maybe set up something like a water rescue task force. A task force in the ICS world, meaning multiple different types of units, that would be because um, you'll have different kinds of boats and people towing their boats and things like that. So, but you would get a predetermined number of resources coming your way, and it wouldn't be automatic. Now we could always talk to the you know the chiefs and see what they can do on their end with with the Northern Wood County Fire Chiefs and potentially Toledo to figure out can we do something where we do get uh, 
mutual aid right off the bat. And that's what Perrysburg Township, Perrysburg City, and Maumee do. Um, if any one of those three gets a water rescue, they're all three going. Um, and then if there's anything in terms of further south, if Maumee gets one, um, and Maumee gets the initial call, Maumee, Waterville, Mount Clover are going. So we've got uh, auto aid to our south, and then obviously Toledo just handles its own stuff. Um, and we just offer to help occasionally. Um, so we have auto aid all around us for this, but we don't have it. So this was the location of the actual collision roughly um, from our marina. And then this is the map wider out showing, it's actually strangely, <laughs> The border is not that far away from the marina in terms of the, what Toledo covers and what we cover. Um, so in our area that, that we can get to quickly with our boat being in the water, we've got Perrysburg Township in Toledo. Uh, and <laughs> I was surprised. I didn't really think about the fact that Toledo would go halfway down all the way to the bridge. Um, and then it turns into mommy. So we've got some options in terms of who we want to ask for uh, and, and what resources we want to look at. For reference, Perrysburg Township has a Zodiac on a trailer. So you'd be getting, like in this case, Utility 74 with Boat 74. Uh, Perrysburg City has their boat in the water in the season like we do. Um, it's a flat bottom boat. I think it's jet propelled. And then Toledo has the fire boat, which is in the water, the dive boat that's in the water. And they also have the staff water rescue and dive team. That's the, besides Hazmat, that's the one thing in Toledo that has to be staffed with a certain number of people, the dive team itself. Uh, every day, and if they don't have enough divers, then they call somebody in to fill that spot. So we have a team that jurisdiction borders us that close, that's ready to go at a moment's notice, potentially, um, that, that we could get started automatically. Um, so I guess the question is, this leads into the discussion, do you guys see the need for that, or is it something that you think we we don't have a lot of water rescues on a regular basis. I mean, it just happened to work out that we had one at the marina on the night we were training on it. But I guess, Chief, what, what would you think in terms of going down that road? I, mean, I don't know if we need to do like an auto aid, but like, and, or like how Perrysburg does it with the three coming. Mm -hmm. I don't see why we couldn't go to the crowd of Perrysburg Township, Perrysburg City, or I wasn't exactly sure from what they want to said, but you guys think we should do, we can always just, I mean, if Perrysburg and Perrysburg Township already has been placed, they got to have some type of SOD and procedure and that we can just, you know, kind of get jump on theirs or whatever, instead of like doing it. I guess the only, the only reason I would kind of think in terms of the Slido thing, half of it is looking at the map. I mean, we're, we're yeah, we it always seems like it's going to be a toss up whose jurisdiction it's going to be. River, actually, right. So between that and the fact that, God forbid something happen, something happens to us or Perrysburg Township or whoever, yeah. to have the ability to have the dive team, yeah. to me that would be... And I mean, we could always talk to them. Yeah, and yeah. hopefully they want to pad their stats. <laughs> and another, well, I don't mean another issue is they're busy down there. And right, oh yeah. Are they even going to be in? And then when they are in, mm -hmm. do they want to come to somebody else right. and stuff? And, I mean, there's a lot of... A lot more things involved in right, right. Perrysburg Township or Perrysburg City, the, the front body of America is a little different. So. Would, it, would it benefit us if we just talked to Toledo and said, hey, if we get a water rescue, we're just going to notify you, let you know that it's yeah, actually happening? Yeah, I mean, if that would be a route, just talk to Jake said it or whatever, and just say this is what we're going to do, and if you're available, we're going to call for you or whatever. Right. I mean, we're going to give you the heads up that it's actually happening. Yeah. yeah. And the, for, um, if you guys didn't see the email, uh, we did forward it on to Chief Jack Zedek, the PIR, um, and to uh, Chief, uh, he's in charge of special operations. We also forwarded it to Chief Kaminsky, who's in charge of uh, operations, field operations, um, which I'll talk about what Chief Kaminsky's looking into in a second. Um, I haven't heard back anything from, from Jack Zedek on it, so. Um, Not a dive team, no. Maybe up in Detroit. Yeah. 
Yeah, they can get us the boat. They've got two boats and a helicopter. Oh, the helicopter out of Station Detroit. Detroit. Um, but yeah, in terms of the actual, you know, if we don't get there and before those those people sink, we end up calling for Toledo anyway as a regional resource. So I don't think they're going to drive the cutter down. God. Well, I'll eventually have to rescue underwater for mm -hmm. the night in minimal. Right, right. I mean, it's usually recovery. It's not rescue, unfortunately, because, I mean, if that person really wasn't conscious by the time we get everybody there, mm -hmm. if Toledo come and everything, they're going to be at least 8, 10, 12 minutes. I mean, they're going to be underwater, not to sound. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, but, right, I mean, realistically, there's guys that work downtown for mid divers for 25 years that have never rescued anybody. They pulled a shit ton of dead bodies out, but right. they've never rescued anybody. Right. Any other thoughts on that before we go on to number five? Which kind of ties in with all this. Um, the interoperability issues with Toledo Fire. Um, we were told Toledo Fire could not go to 15-2. That was the wording that was given to us by Lucas County EMS when Lucas County EMS came over the radio and said, this is what you're getting from Toledo, this is what you're getting from us, just letting you know, this is all on the way. Um, <clears throat> the, like I said, the Deputy Chief of Operations, he said he's gonna have somebody look into why that happened. Um, we also talked to the, one of the staff lieutenants of the alarm office, he said there's no reason that should happen, they should come to our ops channel because that's how the whole system's made to be built. Um, I think, it sounds like the issue is more a training issue. People don't know how to change the zones because all of their all of all of that stuff is on one bank for them, and they never have a reason to change zones. Not for a med channel, not for anything. Um, so there's there's a familiarity familiarity issue there. We brought it up with them. We explained the fact that we're concerned that there's a fam potential familiarity issue there or a complete reluctance to come to our channel. Um, but it's something that needs to be worked out in the event of, you know, we have, say we have a fire, or, you know, on, on Superior, like we've had before, um, you know, where, where we're concerned about losing the block and we wanna call for a couple extra engines or an engine and a truck or whatever from Toledo, and they don't come to our channel, and they stand theirs and they're doing all their stuff, you know, with their chief on their channel and us going on one channel, it's the same as having two commands, except now they can't even hear each other. So, it's an issue that has some major ramifications for really large-scale incidents that um, that we don't see very often, but when we do, we need them to go well. Um, so, in the meantime, until we figure out why or if they can go to our channel, um, they can go to our channel, but what is the holdup from them actually getting to our channel? Basically, figure out which channel you're gonna run it on. Um, this could mean for us, again, for a water rescue, it's usually going to be 15-2. So if we're on 15-2, but they're on 10-5, 10-5, right? If they're on 10-5, which is their ops channel, and they're not going to come to us, but now we've got to figure out, okay, we either have to monitor that channel and be the, the go-between, or we just say, you know what, everybody move to 10-5 because we know our people can change to 10-5 and make it work. Um, there's still that potential that you you need to make sure it's very clear all operations are moving to channel 10-5. Somebody's still going to have to maintain contact with Wood County, <laughs> so you're still going to have to have, as the incident commander, two radios and maybe even another person just to be a go-between. But ideally, instead of having a go-between between the two, because that was, again, one of the one of the incidents I got to overhear at, at Waterville, it was Perrysburg Township had the caller on the line. They had one person from, I think, Maumee relaying to Maumee's crews what the caller was saying, and they never came together on one talk group. So the whole idea of this radio system is that we can all be on one channel when we need to, and one operations, one operation can be on one channel, so we're all on the same page, we can all talk to each other, we can all get the same information. They had boats passing this guy that was hanging on to this tree, and they didn't even know it because it took that extra 10 seconds to, for that to get relayed. So if we can, ideally, if Toledo's not coming to us and we need them for whatever reason for a water rescue, this is more water rescue than fire, um, but maybe consider going to their channel so everybody's on the same uh, talk group um, and then have a go between with dispatch. Does that make sense? It's not ideal, but 
when we're waiting for a solution or waiting for an answer, we've also got to have a plan. Um, and staying on two totally separate channels and having no idea what the other group is doing isn't going to work. So at the very least, monitor both channels and be able to be uh, that middleman or pick and say, you know what, if you guys aren't going to come to 15.2, we'll come to 10.5. We'll put all our operations on 10.5. All right, you guys need another break or you just want to keep going? All right. Um, we've only got five more to go. The last three or so are pretty, pretty simple. So, um, Number six comes back to interoperabilities with the Coast Guard. They, as far as I know, don't even use 800 radios <laughs> the way we do. I think they have them, but I don't know if working downtown, if you've had that, <coughs> running with them, how easy it is to communicate. It seems like talking to the Coast Guard is always an issue. Um, in this instance, you heard that we had, Boat 29 had contact with the Coast Guard, but you heard, how many different voices did you hear coming from the boat? <laughs> you had mine, you had Hennessy's, you had Romanowitz's, and I can tell you, I'm, I was piloting the boat, and Hennessy's down here trying to talk on the radio, screaming into it, because it was so loud, he couldn't hear what the Coast Guard was saying to him. So having the boat have contact with the Coast Guard was helpful that we could get them information because we had the marine radio, but it's not helpful in that that is not what the boat should be focused on during an operation. Um, and going through dispatch, I think you guys heard, it was kind of one of those telephone games where, okay, well, what do you, how many patients do you have? Chief, how many patients do you have? Hold on, boat, how many patients do you have? <laughs> if it can be command to boat 29, Give me that patient number, or give me the number of your patients, and then the chief or his designee can talk directly to the Coast Guard with the VHF radio at the command post. It cuts out dispatch as a middleman and frees them up to really continue monitoring our incident and listen for you know urgent traffic. Um, so again, Marina Command had contact through dispatch. The recommendation that, that came out when we were talking on the tailboard review right afterwards was just to program some of our VHF radios to include the Coast Guard channel so you don't have to be on the boat to talk to the Coast Guard. <laughs> then we have a direct line of contact with them somewhere other than the place that is going to be the most frantic <coughs> during a water rescue. <laughs> um, so that would allow, again, command to Coast Guard, eliminates duplication of efforts, eliminates duplication of information or the potential for incorrect information, um, and it frees Boat 29 from one more thing to worry about. Uh, you heard a lot of confusion about um, unconscious and conscious, a lot of confusion about how many patients. When we got there, there were three boats, three or four boats, and then three jet skis, one person who was obviously hurt, and then a bunch of people who just were screaming at us, get over here, get over here, get over here. That did not allow us a lot of opportunity to figure out how many patients we really had. <laughs> and so that was where a lot of the confusion came into play. We're trying to communicate with the Coast Guard because they're asking us questions trying to communicate with command, letting them know, hey, we're here, we've at least got one, we're still trying to work it out, but our approach, our slow approach, still took about four minutes when you listen to the radio traffic to actually get up to them without causing more of an issue at that location and making sure that we weren't gonna hit anybody that was still in the water. Because there was somebody in the water who wasn't even related to the incident that was just off her jet ski for no reason. So there was a lot of stuff going on that if we can remove that responsibility from the boat, put that in the chief's hands or the, the command officer's hands, um, it'll just streamline things. So, Cap, this is already in the works. I know Lieutenant Hennessy got the, the information yeah, we need for to, it. Need to, uh, I just need to sit down with the chief and see what his actual plan wants to, what his plan wants to be. Okay. Or the plan. Right. To be, so basically moving, moving from here, it's going to be figure out what rigs will have those built in. Yeah, um, so we need to figure out how much room we have in the radios. And, okay. So at some point down the road, when that gets figured out, obviously everybody will be caught up to speed um, with that. Any questions about Coast Guard issues? Mine always is, how the hell do we talk to them? Not necessarily on the radio, but how do you actually speak? Because it's different than what we do. Um, so Lieutenant Hennessy's working on just a simple cheat sheet that we're gonna put on the boat that reminds you how to talk to the Coast Guard because of the marine terminology. Um, and it'll be right in front of you so you don't have to worry about trying to remember the appropriate way to, to hail the Coast Guard and talk like a, a boater. Um, so he's gonna put that together and that'll be included in whatever training we do when we go through and, and do those radios. Um, 
that that gets a little more involved, we'll kind of skip the rest for now. Does that make sense? <laughs> the cheat sheets will be there once we get to the point where we have that. Um, the first one will be on the boat as soon as he gets back in town and gets to do that. Uh, right now, that's just part of the boat operation, uh, boat operators training. So, um, sticking with the boat, talking about riding assignments and potential for headsets. Uh, incident communications were clear and concise. Well, it wasn't very clear coming from the boat because there is a lot of extra noise flying down the river when you're trying to get more information um, and trying to give information. Uh, you know, listening to the audio and I'm listening to myself and it's like, wow, I sound like I'm screaming that we have one more patient who's yellow. Well, I wasn't screaming because I was freaking out that we had another yellow patient. I'm, I'm screaming because it's so loud around me, I'm not smart enough to think, hey, I could probably just talk normally and the noise canceling will work fine. Um, so the headsets are something we're looking into, um, and that goes back to the progress reports too. Were they clear, were they concise, were they timely, were they informative? There were some limitations in terms of the actual incident, but a lot of the communications issues were talking on two radios and talking with a lot of background noise and people screaming and yelling um, once we actually got up to the scene. So this might be part of the, the grant request for the new fire boat that Lieutenant Hennessy's working on. Um, and then riding assignments. Right now, our riding assignments are really vague. It's just one's a boat operator, and it says that boat operator is responsible for manning the radio as well. We figured out that didn't work very well because it's hard to talk on the radio while you're trying to steer into an active water rescue incident without hitting somebody. <laughs> so we're kind of going to, hopefully, Lieutenant Hennessy, uh, being that this is kind of his forte, is going to take a look at, at the riding assignments and figure out, OK, if you've got three people on the boat, one's going to be on the radio, one's going to be strictly piloting the boat, and one's going to be the, the patient care, patient contact person, something along those lines. So you know when you get on the boat exactly what your responsibility is. Uh, number eight, using only one term for a single resource. This is kind of a weird thing that doesn't really come up for us horribly often. Um, the example was MD-51 versus Unit 51 versus Mobile Dock versus Flying Dock versus this one didn't pop up in the radio traffic, but it's something we all refer to them as, dock in a box. Um, so right there, we've got five different names for one thing. So if we've got a new person on who has no idea what the hell a dock in a box is, or what a flying dock is, um, we need to pick one thing and stick with it uh, if we're going to be talking on the radio. So I don't even know for sure if I know what MD stands for. I believe it was just medical doctor um, or medical director, but there's MD4, MD, MD like two, three, and four, which are just the, what, the residents that drive around in the cars, Davey? Do you know? But it's just, they're, yeah. so they're not medical directors, they're just doctors. So we have, we have a term that we have five different ways. We just need to pick one and use that one. Um, so I think Lucas County, they use MD51, MD1. Those are the two crews, or the two units they give us en route. We just need to stick with one. The example that we, uh, run into here with that, that gets a little confusing, um, is usually like the car 30 or the duty officer, which we, we've kind of gotten that one figured out, but we've also got car 29 versus chief 29. If somebody else has the car, and this gets way more confusing for dispatch than I think it does for us, but the car itself is car 29. If the chief is in it, it's chief 29. <laughs> but chief 29 can be separate from his car if, you know, He's out of town, maybe he's just getting back in town, he's got his portable, but you know, say the assistant chief has the Tahoe, now you can have car 29 and chief 29 on scene. So that is kind of a different situation where it's not as, it's not a colloquial use. We're using those terms differently for a purpose. This is more an assignment, um, that's his role. These ones are you know, kind of nicknames. We don't want to use the nicknames, we want to use the actual terms to make sure everybody's on the same page and knows what's coming. Um, I didn't even think about it when, when I heard him say, when I heard Chief say Flying Doc, when I was just sitting here listening to it, and I've listened to this audio, you know, obviously to put this together, I never thought, well, Flying Doc, I would think that would be coming in the helicopter. <laughs> you know, stuff like that, that it doesn't need to be confusing. Let's not make it any more confusing. We already have uh, a high-risk, low-frequency event on our hands. This is one small domino, but it's just one of those things that can make a little a little difference in that, that domino effect of something going bad. If we had a patient that needed the dock and we heard flying dock and we said no, can't, we said cancel the helicopter <laughs> and he didn't catch it and he cancels the dock, that's where that disconnect could come into play. 
Um, BLS kit, on boat 29. We didn't have any medical equipment. We had everything pulled off to do training, which again is unusual, but we also didn't have just a BLS kit anyway. Um, the discussion that happened on the boat was we could stop up and get stuff from the medic unit. Um, we could do it after. Or are you on someone else? No, that's from me. Oh, yeah, no, we, hold on. You can grab it when we're done. There's other reasons why I got put out here. Okay. Um, so we didn't have any anything and we were going to stop up at the marina. And one of the discussions we had was, well, we have an unconscious person. Let's drop somebody off at the scene, then go get the equipment, then come back if we need to, um, just to get somebody there to start patient care. So that was a situation we didn't really want to be in again. Um, the fanny pack is now on the boat. Uh, Monowitz put that together. Um, but we also found the old trauma box that used to be on the boat. So I think that's what Captain Vasek is going to grab right now. Um, and we want to just talk about, this will be a discussion afterwards here, if we want to scrap the fanny pack, put the box back on. Uh, obviously we're limited on some space issues. So kind of looking at the difference between, um, I think one of the things that the, the bigger box has is like suction and some other stuff. So looking at the differences between the resources there, um, what you guys would like to see on the boat, what you want available to you, should you have to go out for a water rescue. So we'll talk about that afterwards when he brings that stuff upstairs. Does anybody have any thoughts on this right now before we move on to number 10? All right. Um, so number 10, this is kind of a weird, screwy one because, again, this was a weird, screwy situation where we just happened to be on the air. Um, dispatch said they didn't really know what rigs were on scene. Even though we gave them the rundown when we were leaving, um, it was still unclear exactly which rigs to have assigned. Um, so if you're going on the air for drill, just make sure you list all the rigs like we, we do anyway. Um, give the location, which I believe we did, but we may have to just say we're going to the marina, and then give the address. So that way, if you say maybe if you say that address, that's going to stick with them a little more to think, okay, they're at that address. Because they're not going to necessarily get it as the Rossford Marina. Um, or they're not necessarily just going to be able to throw the marina on the CAD uh, right off the bat. They may need that address to start that incident. So give the address if you have an address or a nearby intersection, um, and then give locations. I skipped the one other thing. Um, when the, I don't think it was a problem, but if we do have an on view situation like that and say we're split up, make sure you tell them, you know, we're on scene, we have this going on. On scene already are engine 29, medic 29, and chief 29. So that way they already know those are the three that are already there. So it kind of spells it out for them, and it kind of puts everybody else aware, okay, if we were out doing driving, or if we were out you know, split up doing, doing the boat and doing uh, pumps or something, and we're split up into two different groups in two different locations, everybody's aware of what resources are already on scene. Or if another department's monitoring. If you say you came across a major car accident coming back from getting fuel, you, know, you want to tell them you're on scene, they may think that everybody's with you because we were all at drill somewhere. Um, so just make sure you, you make it very clear to them. <laughs> Seems kind of redundant, but make it as clear to Wood County as you can because that's gonna benefit us in the end without getting frustrated if they don't really understand what's going on at first, especially in weird situations like this. Um, so summarizing, uh, hopefully you guys can walk away understanding how the whole incident came together, how, um, how all the agencies responded, how well that worked, um, recognize all those things that made this a successful incident, and then walk away understanding that we can always improve. We can always look, and it's not a negative thing, it's just a, it's a, it's a growth thing. It's looking at ourselves and saying, okay, we did great, let's do better. Um, and it's those little things and those little recognitions that, that take us that step further the next time we get a call. Um, and like I said, for the people who aren't here, who are at Owens tonight, who are at the fair, share this information with them, what you gleaned from this, uh, talk about it. And don't talk about it and not do anything with it. If you have an opinion about this and it's something you really think needs to be done or something, something needs to change or you really didn't like the way something went, go to an officer, talk to an officer, and tell them what you think needs to happen. Because if it, if it stays in a little discussion after drill that, you know, that was really stupid that, that this happened or I really didn't like that, that this was a recommendation, then nobody else knows. <laughs> <laughs>
if you really want something to change, all it takes is saying something. And if you don't get the answer from one officer, keep going to the other officers. Um, the training committee people are always open to listening and taking it to officers uh, who are on the training committee, if it's something like this, obviously. Um, but, but this is, I, I jokingly, not even jokingly really, I said this to somebody recently. It's like, it's, you know, as much as the chiefs run the department, we can take anything to them we want. And if all of us want it, <laughs> they can see that. And like we were just talking about with the, with the, the auto aid thing, like Stop said, if we all want it, they'll make it happen. So if there's something that, that you want to see happen with this department, speak up to the training committee, speak up to your officers, and we'll go from there. Popcorn. Popcorn. Popcorn machine. Um, so unless anybody has any questions, we'll kind of talk, we'll work through the box here and look at what's inside here. Um, any other questions, any comments, thoughts, anything you think we missed when we went over the review? I know. Um, yeah.